Pre-Intermediate Market Leader, Course Book, 3rd Edition, by David Cotton, David Falvey, and Simon Kent. Published by Pearson Longman. Unit 1. Careers. Track 1. Person 1. Well, for a long time, I think I was very ambitious, you know, wanting to get to the top and to earn as much money as possible. But then I decided that other things are more important. I recently decided to take a career break, so I'm travelling for a year and doing some unpaid work. I want to see something of the world and look at my options. Everyone at work says it's not a very good career move, but it's what I want to do. All my friends think I'm mad, but I think I have time. I'm only in my thirties after all. Unit 1. Careers. Track 2. Person 2. It's been very difficult, I think, to get a start without much experience, you know. It's the chicken and egg situation. You can't get a job without experience and you can't get experience without a job. The career opportunities everybody talks about are not really happening for me. Maybe the problem is that I don't really have a career path in mind. I'm still not really sure what I want to do in the long term. I've done different things, but they don't seem to lead anywhere. I don't really know where I'm going. Studying at university made a lot of sense at the time, but now I'm not so sure. I don't feel very prepared for my working life. Unit 1. Careers. Track 3. Person 3. Well, I suppose I always had a career plan, and for me it seems to have been successful. I first worked for the company part-time when I was a student, part of a work placement which I organised myself. I always wanted to work in this area, and only really for one company. They offered me a full-time job, and then I worked my way up the career ladder, from trader to associate to manager to director. I'm now a partner. Maybe it's a bit unusual these days to only work for one company, but for me it's all I wanted. It's only been 17 years, but I'm going to take early retirement next year and buy a boat. Unit 1. Careers. Track 4. Can you tell us about your job? I'm currently the finance director of CSE Media Limited, Chartshow Show Channels Group, which is the largest independent television business in the UK. We have a mixture of 16 channels. Um, some are music, some are children's, and some are movie channels. What was your previous job? I was previously the finance director of a chocolate pudding business. So very different from television, but um, the good thing about being in the finance world is that it's relatively easy to move from sector to sector. The basic skills that you need are, are similar in each case. Unit 1. Careers. Track 5. How did you get into finance as a career? When I was a student, although I was studying chemistry, I thought I would like to do something uh, different afterwards. And I actually did um, a summer internship with one of the big accountancy firms, um, which, was a, which was an excellent way to get an understanding of what the job would be like. I started off as an auditor, and it, it was through that experience that I, I got my first job. Unit 1. Careers. Track 6. Have you had any good advice during your career? Um, yes, I've had lots of advice uh, during my working career. I think the thing that stands out is really not to overcomplicate things. Um, especially in, in the finance world, people can get bogged down in a lot of detail. And it's important to try and uh, maintain clarity and always be able to see above all the numbers that you're given and all the data and what is really the key point and the key decision you have to make. Unit 1. Careers. Track 7. 
What I've found in coming across people who've applied for positions in the companies I've worked um, in is the key difference is people who've done a lot of research on the companies that they've applied to. Um, people have taken the time to not just read company accounts, but you know, uh, research on what the company is moving into and are able to really ask those interesting questions at interview and makes all the difference. So I say research is the key. Unit 1. Careers. Track 8. Good morning, VTS. Which department, please? I'd like to speak to Karina Molinar in Human Resources, please. Thank you. Hold on. I'll put you through. Hello. Human Resources. Hello. Is that Karina Molinar? Speaking. Yes, I'm phoning about your advert in Careers Now. Could you send me an application form, please? Certainly. Can I take some details? Could you give me your name and address, please? Yes, sure. It's Sophie Boiteau, which is B-O-I-T-E-A-U-D. And my address is... Unit 1. Careers. Track 9. Hello. Could I speak to Giovanna, please? I'm afraid she's not here at the moment. Can I take a message? Yes, please. This is Johan from Intec. Could you tell her I won't be able to make the training course on Saturday? She can call me back if there's a problem. I'm on 0191 498 0051. OK, thank you. Bye. Unit 1. Careers. Track 10. Hello, Matt speaking. Hi, Matt. Carl here. Oh, hello, Carl. How are you? Fine, thanks. Listen, just a quick word. Yeah, go ahead. Do you think you could let me have the other number for workplace solutions? I can't get through to them. Their phone's always engaged. Uh, I've got it here. It's uh, 020 9756 4237. Sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Did you say 4227? No, it's 4237. OK, thanks. Bye. No problem. Bye. Unit 1. Careers. Track 11. Extract 1. The children will be no problem. I'll probably send them to an international school in Sao Paulo. My husband's a writer, so he can work anywhere. I've got a career plan. I want to get to the top. I think I can do that and be a good mother as well. You have to be well organized, of course, and be a bit selfish at times. Unit 1. Careers. Track 12. Extract 2. How can we increase sales in the three markets? Well, I'll be checking the performance of the managers and sales reps carefully. I'll set the reps' targets, and if they meet them, they'll get good bonuses. The managers will also have to meet their targets. If they don't, they should start looking for a new job. The main aim of a sales manager is to make money for the company, isn't it? Unit 1. Careers. Track 13. Extract 1. My son is only five, but he'll come with me if I get the job. His father won't be at all pleased, but he can't do anything about it. I could leave my son with his grandparents, but I don't want to do that. I'm sure he'll be all right in a Brazilian school. Children adapt very quickly to new places. It won't be a problem for me or him. Unit 1. Careers. Track 14. Extract 2. What's the best way to improve the performance of the sales teams? 
Well, I'll work closely with the sales managers, try to get a good relationship with them, and I look at the commissions we give the sales reps. Are they high enough to motivate them? I'll check the reps' progress regularly. Also, I'll make suggestions about improving the customer database. That's very important. Unit 1. Careers. Track 15. Extract 1. What kind of person am I? Well, people often say I'm a loner because I've never married, but I think I'm fairly sociable. I'm definitely a bit of an intellectual. I have many interests. Literature, music, um, world cinema, traveling abroad, and getting to know other cultures. Perhaps that's why I've never married or had children. Unit 1. Careers. Track 16. Extract 2. I have the experience and skills to improve our performance in these markets. I'd send the sales teams on team-building courses and have regular meetings with the three sales managers. The job would be a big challenge for me at the end of my career with our company. Of course, I've studied the cultures of the three countries, so I should have no problems working with the sales teams. Unit 2. Companies. Track 17. I am pleased to say the parent company has continued its excellent performance. We are changing, growing and doing well at a difficult time for the industry. Turnover was 57.2 million euros, an increase of 15% on last year, and net profit rose by 5% to 6.4 million euros. We are a highly competitive business. We have increased our market share to 20%. Consequently, our share price has risen and is now at an all-time high of 9.6 euros. Increased production and strong demand have had a positive effect on our cash flow, so we are able to finance a number of new projects. We have successfully moved to our new head office in central London. We are now planning to start full production at the recently opened Spanish subsidiary in October. Finally, Thanks once again to our loyal and dedicated workforce. Our employees will always be our most valuable asset. Unit 2. Companies. Track 18. Can you tell us about your company? Nature's Way Foods is a food manufacturing company based on the south coast of England. Uh, and we put chilled product, uh, a majority of which is lettuce uh, and fruit, into various types of packaging for the major retailers and various food service companies in the UK. Examples of retailers uh, would be Tesco's, Morrison's and Waitrose. And in terms of food service companies, our, our biggest customer is McDonald's which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with. Unit 2. Companies. Track 19. What are the reasons for the company's success? There are various reasons for the company's success. I think one of the major ones is the, the markets in which we operate. There are some what we call big marketing themes, which are health, convenience, sustainability and indulgence. We think the products we produce in both leaf and fruit fit a lot of those themes. So a majority of the UK population have a desire to eat healthy products. Uh, they tend to be what we call time poor, i.e. they haven't got much time in their lives for creating great food. So they want to be able to buy a convenient product of good healthy food. There is also a theme for sustainability. Uh, so people want to feel like they are contributing towards a sustainable world. And a lot of our product uh, has a fairly low level of what we call food miles. 
and therefore is fairly sustainable. Uh, some of our products also have a fairly indulgent feel. So the UK population uh, has a habit of wanting to be indulgent at certain times. So they might diet on a Monday to Friday, but when it gets to Friday night, they will have several pieces of cake <laughs> and maybe a few drinks. I think the other reason for our success is the way we run our business. We are a high volume business, so we're producing uh, hundreds of millions of units. So we need to be very efficient in the way we produce them. So we've invested heavily as a business in systems and process to make sure we are very efficient in the manner in which we produce the products for our customers. Unit 2. Companies. Track 20. When running a company, what have you enjoyed most and least? I think most is achieving what you set out to achieve. So when you're running a company, uh, one of your key objectives or key roles is to set, set the strategy for the company and then make sure the building blocks are in place to achieve that strategy. And that I find very satisfying to set a clear goal for the business and then watch the business uh, and help the business go and achieve that goal. I think the other thing which I find uh, very satisfying is creating a team ethic uh, and watching the people grow and watching people develop and work towards the goals that you set as a business and work as a team and get enjoyment out of that and develop as people and as business people within the organisation. And least? I think least is probably the relentlessness of the role as a chief executive. You're never actually off duty. And a business like ours, which is a food manufacturing company, it's running 364 days a year. So there's always something to be responsible for uh, and something that's happening within your organisation. So I think that can be quite tiring. And also, uh, the other thing that sometimes uh, uh, can be wearing is it is a, quite a lonely life. You know, you have to make decisions. Sometimes you can't talk to other people about them uh, and they have to be your decision. Unit 2. Companies. Track 21. What lessons have you learned from the companies you've worked for? I've learned a lot of lessons from the companies I've worked for. I think the key thing is that you have to make sure your people in the organisation are engaged with the organisation and have a clear understanding of what that organisation is trying to achieve. If you can get that clarity of direction and um, enthusiasm from the people within the organisation, uh, then that will help move the business forward in itself. Unit 2. Companies. Track 22. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to my presentation. My name's Robert Pullen. I'm the Director of Human Resources at DCV Fashions. My purpose today is to talk to you about our company. You can then decide if you'd like to work for us in the future. First, I'll give you some basic information about DCV Fashions. After that, I'll explain why we've been so successful in the fashion industry. Next, I'll tell you about our mission statement. This describes what we're all about, why we're in business. And finally, I'll explain how we communicate with people through our advertising and promotion. Unit 2. Companies. Track 23. OK, some basic facts. We were founded in Florence in 1990. That's where we're currently based. Since then, we've expanded at a very fast rate and established our brand worldwide. We make and sell clothing and fashion accessories for the 18 to 30 age group. 
please take a look at the chart. It shows our financial performance over a five-year period. As you can see, last year our turnover was over 300 million euros, and our net profit approximately 28 million. What's the key to our success? Well, I'd say there are three reasons we've grown so rapidly. We have a very talented team of young designers. Our distribution system is first class, and we're very creative when advertising and promoting our products. Moving on now to our mission. It's to be a dynamic company, constantly changing, but always leading fashion. Fun, youth, action, energy. This is what our brand is all about. Finally, a word about our advertising and promotion. DCV advertises on all the Italian TV networks, as well as those in other major European markets. It sponsors fashion shows, and its products are endorsed by many celebrities in the world of music and sport. Well, I hope you'll be interested to learn more about our company. Thanks very much for listening to my presentation. Are there any questions? Unit 2. Companies. Track 24. It's true our results haven't been good. Our pre-tax profits have fallen once again. It's all very worrying. Well, we know one of the reasons. Our two main competitors have been cutting their prices, so our prices are beginning to look rather high. They've also been increasing their advertising spend to get a bigger market share. But it doesn't explain everything, does it? How do you see things, Donna? It's not a crisis, Paolo, but we do need to make changes as fast as possible. The way I see it, we don't offer a very wide range of flavors. That's not helping us. And our packaging isn't very exciting. It gives the wrong impression. It could be the reason why our classic product isn't selling as well as it used to. Okay, so what do we need? More products and more outlets. We must reach more than the big supermarkets and our own ice cream stores. Also, it'd be a good idea to upgrade our equipment and storage facilities. Maybe our fleet of trucks as well. They're terribly out of date. Hmm, plenty to think about there, Donna. How about you, Bill? Well, I'd say innovation is the key. We need more new products, exciting new products people will want to buy. Don't forget, people are health conscious these days. So how about bringing out some fat-free flavors? 100% fat-free, made from natural ingredients, no additives? Another thing, Paolo, we need to be more green, to do more for the environment. You know, recycle our containers, take the fat out of our waste products, then give the pure water to local communities, that sort of thing. Maybe donate money to charities like a heart or cancer foundation. That'd improve our image for sure. Unit 3. Selling. Track 25. Extract 1. I like shopping for things I'm interested in buying, like clothes, but I really hate going to the supermarket. I just find it really boring, walking round and round, looking for things. Supermarkets don't seem very well organised for customers. They have fruit and vegetables near the entrance, but then heavy things are further away, and they move things around, which makes it difficult. Often the staff don't know where things are and can't help you. Unit 3. Selling. Track 26. Extract 2. I love the internet for shopping. I buy lots of things on it. It's just so easy and convenient. Most retailers now work online. You can compare prices and products so easily. I also like the auction sites like eBay. You can get some real bargains. Some people say it's risky to shop this way. Things can go wrong. But I've never had a problem. A lot of my friends like shopping malls, but I really hate them. They're always so crowded 
and they make me feel tired. Unit 3. Selling. Track 27. Extract 3. I enjoy the experience of shopping. You know, being a customer, being made to feel special. I prefer specialist shops where service is more personal, where people remember you, know your name and can help you. I also like trying to get discounts when I'm shopping, actually doing a deal with the assistants. I really enjoy shopping for shoes. I don't think it's something you can do on the internet, although I know people do. Unit 3. Selling. Track 28. What does QVC do? QVC is a global multi-channel retailer. We sell product across a wide variety of categories, from food through to fashion, through to accessories, through to beauty, to gardening and DIY. And we sell to consumers in Germany, Japan, USA, UK and Italy. And we sell both through our, the television and online. Unit 3. Selling. Track 29. What's the secret of a really good sales presentation? Firstly, having a product that you can easily demonstrate and a product that has a good story behind it. Secondly, that the person who's actually giving the, the sales presentation can engage with their audience in a credible fashion, can tell the story very clearly and can demonstrate the features and benefits of each product in a very clear and easy to understand way. Can you give us an example of how you develop a sales pitch? First of all, it's all in the preparation. So it's all about knowing the product inside and out, what the product can do, what it can't do, when it is suitable, when the product isn't suitable, and then be able to demonstrate uh, the product to its best advantage in a very clear and precise fashion, but also in an engaging way. Unit 3. Selling. Track 30. What was QVC's most successful product sale and why? We have many successful product areas. One of our strongest is beauty. Beauty works so well on TV for two reasons. First of all, each beauty brand has a fantastic story behind it and we can really bring life to the brand and to the product presentation through telling that story in a very engaging way. And secondly, each product is very easy to demonstrate. So if it's a skincare product like a moisturiser, we can show how to apply it, how much to apply in order to give the best effects. Finally, we add another layer to our sales presentation in that we may invite the expert behind that product to tell the story. Are some types of product easier to sell than others? Yes, and in fact some products are very difficult to sell on our business model. So take fragrance for example. Clearly the main uh, piece you want to communicate with a fragrance is how it smells and that can be very challenging to do through a television environment. Unit 3. Selling. Track 31. How has online shopping altered the way you sell? It's given us a fantastic opportunity to sell in a different way to our consumers. So if a customer wants to buy a skincare product at 10 o'clock at night, and perhaps on air we're showing a gardening item, she can now go down to our website, she can browse through the range of product online that suit her at that moment in time. She can see a image of the product, she can see the product description, she can see what other customers think about the product through our ratings and reviews service and as well she can see the video demonstration. So it opens up our range of 15,000 products to the customer at any time, day or night. Unit 3. Selling. Track 32. So, your plan is to provide electric cars in your town centre. People will rent them to do their shopping, go about their business and so on, right? Yes. Pollution is a big problem here. We're trying all sorts of ideas to reduce it. We're interested in starting with 10 electric cars. 
If it works, we'll increase the number later on. I see from your price list that a standard two-seater car will cost about twelve thousand euros. Is that correct? Yes,、uh, the price includes transport and insurance costs. If you order ten vehicles, you'll be paying us about a hundred thousand euros, minus the two percent discount we offer a new customer. But if you increased your order, we could offer a much higher discount. Okay, how much would that be? Well. For an order of twenty or more vehicles, the discount would be five percent. I see. Let me think about it. What about delivery? We'd like to start the program in June, if possible. Hmm. To be honest, that's a bit early for us. We've got a lot of customers waiting for delivery. We could possibly deliver by late August, all being well. Hmm. That might be okay. If you can guarantee delivery by then, I'd have to discuss it with our production department. I'll get back to you on that. Good. How about the warranty? Would like a long period. It's for two years. That's what we normally offer. Only two years. You know, if you could offer us a longer warranty, would be delighted. How about five years? Hmm. Well, that's much longer than normal. It could be all right, as long as you pay more for the longer period. I don't know. I'll check with my colleagues. I can't give you a decision right away. Okay. What about payment? Do you offer credit terms? I'm afraid not. It's company policy for a new customer. We need payment by bank transfer on receipt of the goods. Oh, and we ask for a down payment of twenty percent of the value of the order. A down payment as well. I see. Right. Well, I think we've covered some of the main points. How about some lunch now?、Hmm. After lunch, I'd like to discuss after-sales service. It's important for us that you give reliable sales support. Unit three, selling, track thirty-three. I suggest the first item should be the length of the agreement. We need to agree how many years we want it to be for, and after that, let's talk about the number of rooms you want and what types of rooms you'd like to reserve for your customers. Okay. Yes, that makes sense to me. First, the length of the contract, and then the number and type of rooms. After that, I suppose services come next. That item could take some time to discuss. Yes, I think it'll take the most time. So services will be the third item on the agenda, and I'll allow quite a bit of time for that. Next, how about advertising? No, I think that should come later. We need to talk about the rates next, and especially any discounts you can offer on your listed prices. Okay, rates can come before advertising. We'll probably have quite a long discussion about discounts, so I'll make time for that. And then finally, we can talk about advertising costs. I hope that won't take too long. How's that? That's fine. I'm happy with the agenda. I think it covers all the main points we need to talk about. Good. See you next week then. Goodbye. Bye. Working across cultures, one, track thirty-four. Many of you will travel to foreign countries on business, or go to international conferences and sales fairs. Some of you may end up living and working in a foreign country. For all of you, cultural and social awareness will be important if you want to become effective communicators when you're abroad. Today, I'm going to look at saying no politely. Whenever you say yes to a request. You are doing so at a cost. That cost is usually your time. Sometimes you just have to say no. I remember two embarrassing occasions when I had to say no. One was in Finland, when a business friend invited me to a sauna. I just felt uncomfortable. The other was in Hungary, a country where it's sometimes okay to share private details. Someone asked me something rather personal. Again, I felt a bit uncomfortable. In the first part of my talk, 
I'm going to look at five tips for saying no politely. Firstly, pay attention. Listen carefully and make sure you don't say no before the other person has even finished making their request. Listen to the request with an open mind. Secondly, offer alternatives. You may even be able to recommend someone else who is more suitable. Thirdly, show sympathy if someone asks you to do something that you can't do. Show that you genuinely wanted to help. Next, be as clear as possible to avoid misunderstandings. Don't say maybe when you really mean no. And finally, avoid long reasons and excuses. Sometimes the less you say, the better. The times I've had to say no the most is when customers have wanted huge discounts. As long as you can say no politely with a smile, followed by a genuine I'm sorry, then you should be fine. Working Across Cultures 1, Track 35 In the second part of my talk, I'll look at saying no in different countries. Japanese people hate saying no. They don't even like using negative endings to verbs, and they don't like any confrontation. So it's important to look at their non-verbal communication. They believe in harmony. They think that turning down someone's request causes embarrassment and loss of face to the other person. Many negotiators have come away from meetings in Japan thinking they have got agreement when in fact they haven't. Indonesians can also communicate indirectly. They don't like to cause anyone embarrassment by giving a negative answer. So the listener has to work out what they really mean. In fact, Bahasa Indonesian has 12 ways of saying no and also other ways of saying yes, when the real meaning is no. The Chinese will often avoid saying no. They have an expression which means, we'll do some research and discuss it later, which is a polite way of saying no. Silence in China can also imply that there are problems. Silence in the Arab world is quite common, however, and does not necessarily mean no. The Arab world does not find silence difficult. However, saying no in the wrong situations can have bad consequences. An American business friend of mine once refused a cup of coffee from a Saudi businessman at the start of a meeting. In America, that wouldn't have been a problem, but this was seen as rather rude by the Saudi host, and the meeting was unsuccessful. My friend should have accepted the coffee and just had a small cup. I'll now move on to... Working Across Cultures 1, Track 36, 1. Would you like to go out for a meal later? Thanks for the invitation, but I'm not feeling so well. Maybe some other time. 2. Would you like some more food? Nothing more for me, thanks. It was delicious. 3. Shall we meet up next Tuesday? I'm sorry. I'd love to, but I have other plans that evening. Four. Please stay a little bit longer. I've had a wonderful time, and I wish I could, but I really have to go. Five. Can you check that the fire exit notices are all in the right place, please? I'm afraid you've come to the wrong person. You'll have to ask Ingrid in health and safety. Unit 4. Great Ideas. Track 37. Great ideas are generated in different ways. Sometimes an idea may simply be when a company takes advantage of an opportunity to extend its product range, to offer more choice to existing customers, or a great idea could allow a company to enter a market which was closed to it before. Companies which are prepared to spend a lot on R&D may make a breakthrough by having an original idea for a product which others later copy, for example, Sony and the Walkman. On the other hand, some products are developed in response to customer research, 
they come from customer ideas. These products are made to meet a need, to satisfy consumer demand. Or the product does something similar to another product, but faster, so it saves time. Some people will buy new products because the product raises their status, gives them a new, more upmarket image. Unit 4 Great Ideas, Track 38. Other people will buy any green product which reduces waste or protects the environment, even if it is more expensive. If an idea is really good and the product fills a gap in the market, it may even win an award for innovation. Unit 4 Great Ideas, Track 39. In your opinion, what were the best business ideas of the last 15 years? I thought about this for quite a long time and in my opinion it's a service and two products. The first is eBay and this works for me because it provides individuals and small businesses with a channel to market that didn't exist before started in the dot-com boom and has been extremely successful with a turnover in 2009 of 2.4 billion dollars. It's not a new idea though. Running an auction is almost as old as society. It's based on a model of traditional auctions. It's just transferred the model and the thinking to a different environment. My second is the product, and it's a USB stick for computers or plug-and-play devices. This enabled data and pictures to be easily transportable and satisfied a demand for easy portability from computer to computer. The amount of data that can be transported now is enormous, and it had the huge benefit of meaning that you didn't have to take your portable computer with you everywhere. So it satisfied a basic customer need. The technology itself also enabled a lot of other devices. The final one is the digital camera. I'm not sure it's, if it's strictly an invention of the last 15 years or if it's just become a mass market item. But it's revolutionised photography and it's now incorporated into many other devices as a free gift, like mobile phones or PCs. And again, it satisfied a customer demand to share pictures and images quickly and easily. Unit 4. Great Ideas. Track 40. Do companies spend enough time on research and development? I think this depends very much on the industry. There are some product-based companies, like pharmaceuticals and high-tech companies, that spend an enormous amount of time and money on research and development. Nearly 25% of the costs of sale, for example, at Ericsson, the Finnish mobile phone company, are on research and development. I strongly believe that most companies can benefit from using information and relationships within their own company to actually develop new products and services. My definition of innovation is to look at what everybody else sees and see something different. So that might mean looking at what you already do and looking at where you can do it slightly differently to increase your product range or extending your products into new markets. This can save time and money. Unit 4. Great Ideas. Track 41. OK, everyone, let's begin, shall we? Our main purpose is to decide the date of the launch for our new product, DM2000. After that, we've got to decide the recommended retail price for the phone and talk about our marketing plans, okay? 
May, what's your opinion? Should we launch in June or September? Personally, I'm in favor of June. Let's get into the market early and surprise our competitors. It could give us a big advantage. It might even force them to bring out their new phones earlier. I mean, before they're really ready to do so. Thanks, May. What do the rest of you think? Chang, how do you feel about this? Well, um, I'm not sure about June, really.、Um, I think it's too early. In fact, far too early. We need more time to plan our marketing. You know, a lot of people, potential buyers, will be away on holiday in June. It's not the best time to have a launch. We need to start with a real bang. Hmm, thanks, Cheng. Wan, what's your view? I believe you'd prefer a later date for the launch, is that correct? Yeah, June's too early. I think September's the best time. We can promote the smartphone strongly then with a multimedia campaign.、Mm. The last three months of the year have always been the peak period for selling new electronic products. That's when we need to put the phone on the market. Hmm, I agree. I think there are good reasons for choosing September. What about the recommended retail price for the phone? Any thoughts on that? Hold on a minute. I thought we were talking about the launch date, not the price. Okay, May, maybe we are moving a little too fast. Let's get back to the point. I get the feeling that most of us seem to prefer September. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe. Okay, we're agreed. The launch is in September. Now, what about the price? Wan, I asked you to bring us ideas about this. I know we've set a price, but we should think again. I think it should be about 900 Hong Kong dollars.、Uh, and your reasons? Well, simply, our main competitor brought out a smartphone recently.、Mm-hmm. It retails at just over 1,000 Hong Kong dollars. If we sell at 900, we'll be undercutting them by 10%. So we'll have a big price advantage at the start of our launch. Good. We need to be sharp on pricing. Now, what sales outlets do you think we should target, Wan? No problem there. We could start with the specialist mobile phone stores and big department stores. After that, we could look at other distribution channels. You know, stations, airports, that sort of thing. Right. Sounds okay to me. Everyone happy with one suggestions? Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. Unit 4 Great Ideas, Track 42. You know, Jane, I'm really looking forward to choosing the winner of this competition. It seems to be creating enormous interest all over the world. Yes, a lot of people have asked for application forms. What are you looking for? I mean, how will you judge the projects? There are three things that are really important. They'll help me to make up my mind. The winner will have to come up with a great idea for an attraction. It'll have to be something different, a bit unusual. But linked in some way to the culture of the community or country. It could be anything, as long as it's exciting a museum, an art gallery, a theme park, or a research study center. The possibilities are endless. I want people to use their imagination. That's the idea of the competition. I see. What else will be important? Well, the new attraction must provide an enjoyable experience for visitors. They should really enjoy the visit and talk about it with their friends afterwards. Can you give an example? Well, I was very impressed with the Kennedy Museum in Boston. There was a replica of the Oval Office when John F. Kennedy was president. There are a lot of interesting exhibits, including the rocking chair he used to sit in. Sounds fascinating. I'll visit it if I ever get to that part of the world. One other thing that's important, Jane. I want the new attraction to make money. It must be self-financing. If it makes money, it can contribute financially to other facilities that the community needs. It shouldn't have to receive local government funds once it's been set up. The winner will have to come up with lots of ideas on how it can make money. I want it to be a commercial proposition. 
Unit 5. Stress. Track 43. What are the usual causes of stress at work? There are lots of things that can make people feel under pressure at work. For example, having too much to do, not feeling in control, and also not having good relationships with the people that they work with. All of these things can build up and when pressure gets too much, it spills over into feelings of stress. How does your company help businesses to deal with stress? One of the things that we do is be able to help companies identify which areas of the, of the company are experiencing stress and then we can work with those people to help build their resilience to stress. Now what that means is actually helping people to respond differently to stressful situations so that they actually feel calmer when they're put in situations that they previously found stressful. Unit 5. Stress. Track 44. How much stress at work can be considered normal? It's difficult to say really what's a normal level of stress for somebody to feel at work. Um, the problem with that is that what one person finds really motivating and it excites them to be able to do their job well, somebody else might find really, really stressful. What we do see is that actually a high level of continued pressure can actually sometimes spill over into feelings of stress. So although you might be quite, um, you're doing quite well at managing stress for a long period of time, actually if it continues without any break, then actually people sometimes tip over into feeling very stressed. Unit 5 Stress. Track 45. How can companies help their staff to achieve a work-life balance? Work-life balance is an interesting question um, because, again, everybody has a different sense of what works for them. However, companies can really help by being flexible in how they expect staff to work. For example, if somebody doesn't like travelling in rush hour, you know, perhaps they could come in a little bit early and leave a little bit early. And other examples might be just making sure that people don't feel that they have to stay late just because their boss is working late. Unit 5. Stress. Track 46. Do you find that men and women deal with stress differently? What we do see is that women tend to experience higher levels of stress or at least report higher levels of stress. We're not sure exactly why this is. It could quite possibly be because women tend to have more responsibility in the home as well. So actually managing the home, looking after children. So they have many more sources of pressure in their life and therefore are more likely to feel stressed because of that. The other possibility is that women are perhaps more open about their feelings and therefore feel more comfortable in reporting, you know, feeling under pressure and or feeling stressed. Unit 5. Stress. Track 47. OK, let's talk about these staff's health and fitness. Last year, days lost increased by over 15% because of sickness and absenteeism. Ooh. That can't go on. We've got to do something about it. Any suggestions, Daniel? Well, I think we should carry out a survey, find out why staff are so stressed and unhealthy. That'd help. At least we'd know what the problems are. I have another idea. Why don't we encourage staff to keep fit? How about paying for their subscription to a gym if they go, say, twice or more a week? Mm, that's an interesting idea. But it could be a bit costly. What about staff who have a very heavy workload? What should we do to help them? Um, we could hire more staff for them, give them an assistant. You know, some of them even work at the weekend. Uh, how about banning staff from working at weekends? That'd solve the problem. They'd have more time to relax then, wouldn't they? Mm. Well, I suppose we could do that. It's something to consider. 
You know, there's been a lot of complaints lately from staff who drive to work. Mm. They get really stressed when they get stuck in traffic jams. And mothers with young children find it difficult to get to work on time. What do we do about them, Kevin? Why don't we introduce flexi-time for parents with young children? I think we should offer it to our admin staff, and maybe to some staff in other departments. Also, perhaps some staff could work from home. Mm, yes, interesting ideas. I've got a good suggestion, Kevin. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Well, it might be a good idea to set up a counselling service with a professional counsellor. Staff could go there and talk about their problems. Mm. Oh, yes, and another idea I've just thought of. Why not let staff change duties and roles from time to time mm. to give them a bit of variety in their work? Mm, I think this needs further thought. Let's meet tomorrow, same time, and try and come up with a plan to improve the staff's health and fitness. Right. Unit 5. Stress. Track 48. I think we should definitely pay staff subscriptions to the sports centre. If they were fitter, they wouldn't be sick so often and take days off work. And they'd work harder if they were healthier. Mm, I don't know, Danielle. It would be popular, but it could be expensive. What do you think, Kevin? I think I agree with you, Bridget. It'd cost a lot, and attendance would be difficult to monitor. I mean, we couldn't check each week to see if the staff were attending the sports centre. We're not Big Brother, checking up on staff all the time. Yes, but we could get over that problem somehow. Mm -hmm. The sports centre has great facilities. A big pool, a squash club, hairdressing salon. Yeah, you're right. Its facilities are fantastic. Also, it has some restrooms with ergonomic furniture where people can just relax and chat to each other. It's very relaxing there. Our staff will get to know each other better. Exactly. It would really help staff to be more healthy. Um, improve communications and save the company money, in the long run anyway. I can't agree with you there, Danielle. I'm not sure it's a good idea. Surely it's not our responsibility to encourage staff to go to a sports club. They should go there because they want to be fit and in good health. It's their responsibility, not ours. We don't want to run their lives for them. Hmm... I don't know. I still think it's a good idea. It's well worth trying. If it becomes too expensive or it isn't getting results, we can stop paying their subscriptions. It's as simple as that. Unit 5. Stress. Track 49. Hello, Sheila Murray speaking. Hi, it's Jessica. How are you, Sheila? Fine, thanks. You? I've got a big problem here. I don't know what to do. It's about James. Oh, what's happening? Well, you know, he's been very stressed lately. His wife wants to leave him. And he's been working day and night on this contract. It's really important for all of us. Okay. Well, he got really drunk last Saturday with our clients. I didn't like the way he talked. Very loudly, you know, always interrupting them, making jokes that weren't funny and stupid comments. The clients weren't at all impressed. Mm-hmm. Then he didn't turn up for the meeting on Monday. And now he's just disappeared. It's two days now. No one seems to know where he is. Our clients aren't happy at all. I don't think they want to complete the deal now. I just don't know what to do. Can't you take James's place at the meeting? The contract's almost ready to sign, isn't it? Well, there are still a few points, but how can I take over? It would look really bad, wouldn't it? I'm just a junior account executive. James has been the main guy all along. I think he's had a breakdown, Sheila. He just can't cope anymore. Okay, Jessica. I'll talk to some of my colleagues and get back to you. We'll sort this out for you. <sighs> Thanks, Sheila. I'd appreciate that. Bye. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 50.
Hello, Flanagan's. How can I help you? Oh, uh, yes. Hello. I'd like to book a table for tomorrow night for six people, please. Yes, madam. And what sort of time? About eight. Let me see. Uh, yes, that's fine. And what's the name, please? It's Branson. That's fine, Miss Branson. So, a table for six at eight o'clock. We'll see you tomorrow evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good evening. Uh, do you have a reservation? Oh, hello, yes. It should be under the name of Branson. Uh, yes, here we are. A table for six. Your table will be just a couple of minutes. Uh, would you like to have a drink at the bar first? And I can bring you some menus as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Sounds mm. good. Why not? Well, it all looks very good, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So, are you ready to order? Yes. Is there anything you recommend? Well, the fish is very good today. Well, as a starter, I'd like the soup. And then to follow, I'll have the salmon with dill butter. Thank you very much. That was very good. And uh, would you like to see the dessert menu? Uh, no, I don't think so. Just some coffee, I think. And the bill, please. Yes, certainly. Very good, sir. Well, that was really good. I'll leave a good tip. Yes, we should. It's excellent here. We must come again. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 51. Can you tell us about your company? My company is the Cavendish Consultancy. It is a corporate entertainment and corporate event company based in West London. It operates in all sports, show business and performing arts, mainly in the United Kingdom, but we also tender for overseas events, which gives us the opportunity to spread our knowledge and skills and expertise around the world. What are the most popular events for corporate entertaining? The most popular events remain the major sports and the major events in those sports. Within sports it does vary. For example, those sports where the rules are fairly simple and straightforward are more popular. Thus, cricket, which is a personal um, like of mine, is not actually one of the most popular because the rules are fairly complicated. Horse racing is very successful. Football, soccer, as it's called in many countries around the world, but football in England, <laughs> is very popular. Um, motor racing works well. And then moving on to the entertainment side, the theatre, pop concerts, musicals particularly. Um, for a number of years, Phantom of the Opera has been very popular in New York and in London and in many other cities around the world where it has showed. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 52. Is corporate entertainment changing as the economy changes? Cavendish has been in business 30 years, so we've seen two, if not three, recessions. In fact, were founded in 1981, which was a recession in the UK. And it does change, and it's also changed enormously over those 30 years the quality of the product that we develop, deliver now is vastly superior, much, much better than the product we delivered in 1981. The, the recent downturn, and particularly because the downturn has affected the financial sector, and the financial sector was a very big entertainer, has changed quite significantly, not so much the product, but people have reduced budgets, and when they reduce budgets, they have, act, perhaps surprisingly, not gone for a cheaper product, but just taken fewer people 
to the expensive products. So the top of the range hospitality is holding up better than the less expensive alternatives. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 53. What do you think makes a corporate event successful? First, you have to identify your aim, your purpose in entertaining people at this particular event. That's absolutely key. If you don't know why you're doing it, probably don't do it. Um, then, having identified why you're doing it, it's all the planning and all the little things. You can have the very best sporting event, the very best pop concert, but if the little things go wrong, that's what people remember. So it's contingency planning, it's having backups. And if it rains, have some umbrellas there. The catering is absolutely vital. People now expect a very high standard of food and drink. And then bear in mind that it is the staff on the day who will meet all the guests. It's not the overall event organiser. I can't meet every guest of every, at every Cavendish event. It's the quality and the training and the briefing of the staff that you employ on the day is absolutely key. And the last thing I would say is always follow up afterwards. And I think that gives the opportunity to cement the relationship. Did you enjoy the day? And what else would you like to go to? And those sorts of things. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 54. The most extravagant event I've ever heard of was in July 1998 when the British Grand Prix, the motor race at Silverstone, was on the same day as the FIFA Soccer World Cup final in Paris. And it was then possible to get a helicopter from central London to Silverstone. Now Silverstone is about 60 miles, 100 kilometers northwest of London. So you helicoptered to the ground, you watched Michael Schumacher win the race, you helicoptered back to London Heathrow, the big airport just to the west of London, and then you flew in an aeroplane that was then the best aeroplane in the world, Concorde, to Paris. It didn't go supersonic, um, that is above the speed of sound, um, but you did go to Paris in Concorde and flew back that night, so in less than 24 hours you had seen a Formula One motor race and the World Cup final. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 55. Conversation 1. Hello, I'm Liz. Oh, hello again, Liz. How are you? It's Jane. We met in Paris last year. Oh, yes! I didn't recognize you. Your hair is a bit different. I'm fine. And what about you? I'm very well, thanks. And how's business? It's going really well, especially in Italy. Great! Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 56. Conversation 2. Ah, oh, James, have you met Sam Clark? No. Hello, Sam. Good to meet you. I think we both know Mike Upton. We work together in Turkey. Oh, yes, uh, Mike. He's in China now. Really? I didn't know that. Give him my regards next time you see him. Yes, I will. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 57. Conversation 3. Julia, do you know Jürgen? Yes, of course. Hello, Jürgen. Good to see you again. How are things? Fine, thanks, Julia. It's great to see you again. Unit 6. Entertaining. Track 58. 
Conversation four. Hi, I'm John. Hello, John. Pleased to meet you. I'm Lisa from the Amsterdam office. Oh, Amsterdam! I've never been, but I hear it's a great city. Very lively. Yes, it is. It's great. You should come. The conference is going to be there next year. Oh, I'd love to. I'll look forward to it. Unit six, entertaining, track fifty nine, conversation five. Carla, I'd like you to meet one of our best customers, Linda Eriksson from SRT in Sweden. Hello, Linda. Great to meet you at last. I've heard a lot about you. Not all bad, I hope. Not at all. It's great to be able to put a face to a name. Absolutely. Unit six, entertaining, track sixty. It's not going to be easy to please everyone, Kate. What are the most important things, do you think? Actually, I've made a list of things we'll need. Shall I go through it with you? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Well, we're looking for a hotel that's good value for money. It's a priority for us because we've got to keep costs down. The conference center must have a really big room for, say, a hundred people, because there will be some presentations that everyone must attend, and we'll need at least four meeting rooms. We're going to have quite a few workshops and training sessions, as we usually do. Yes, and the meeting rooms will need to be quite big, Kate, with enough room for say twenty-five participants. Even more if it's a popular session. Yeah, good point. We have to think carefully about the location for the conference. If possible, it shouldn't be too far away from an airport. Most people will be arriving by air. We don't want them to have problems finding the hotel, like they did last year. A shuttle service from the airport to the hotel would be a plus, don't you think? Yeah, but not all hotels offer that facility. True. One other thing: it's important that the center has good leisure facilities. We want staff to enjoy themselves as well as take part in work sessions. Don't forget, they're free on Friday, and they could also have some free time early on Monday as well. Right. We certainly don't want them to go away complaining they didn't enjoy themselves or have enough time to buy presents for friends and relatives. Yeah, there'll be a gala dinner on the Sunday evening. They should enjoy that. It'll be an opportunity for everyone to relax, do some networking, and meet colleagues from all over the world. Working across cultures two, track sixty one. I am pleased you like our food, Mr. Morgan. My son Ahmed will now bring us some cakes and pastries. Which would you like to try? I'm sorry, I just can't eat anything more. Oh, surely you could try just one. No, really, that's enough for me. I'm just not used to eating such big meals.、Uh, actually, I'm on a diet at the moment. Oh, I see. What a pity. You know, we are famous for our pastries. Really, I didn't know that. Well, as you know, my company has stores in all the major cities here. I'm sure you've heard about our business. Most of the stores sell household goods, and they're located in busy main streets. Ah, actually, I didn't know that. My colleague Hussein gave me your number and told me to contact you. I was very busy just before I left England, so I didn't have much time to prepare for this visit. I see, I see. Yes, Hussein emailed me to say you would be visiting us, so I expected to hear from you. Tell me, what's your main purpose in coming here? Well, we want to sell our products in Morocco. We're not doing that at the moment, and we plan to start by distributing our goods through large department stores. Eventually, I suppose, we'll set up a sales facility here. We've used this approach in other new markets, and it's worked well for us. It's a good formula. I see. I'm not sure if that approach will work well here in Morocco, using department stores.、Oh. But I could give you some contacts if you like. People I know who have shops here, ones that sell a lot of household products. Thanks very much, but perhaps next time. 
I'm going to see the British consulate tomorrow. They're going to give me some names of people to visit. I have to leave next Wednesday, so I don't have much time. I want to arrange as many visits as possible. It would be nice to take home some informal agreements with one or two companies, then later sign the written contracts. We want to have distribution agreements with some local business people by the end of the year. The end of the year? In only three months? Look, maybe I can help you. Why don't you leave me some of your business cards? If I meet someone who could help you, I'll give them your card and ask them to get in touch. Yes, good idea. It could be very useful. Uh, here are some of my cards. Thanks very much. Mmm, they are very well designed. Everything is in English, I see. Yes, most business people speak English these days, don't they? Well, thanks very much, Mr. Mansur. I've had a very enjoyable meeting. It was a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Morgan. Can I give you a word of advice? Mm -hmm. Try to learn as much as you can about the business culture here before your next visit. The more you know, the easier it is to do business here. Have a safe journey home. Working Across Cultures 2 Track 62 Extract 1 I made a big mistake when I negotiated with a Korean team. There were four people in their team, and I talked mostly to a younger man who spoke excellent English. I thought he was the team leader. I didn't say much to the oldest man in the group. He sat silently for some time because his English wasn't very good. But later in the meeting, the old man took control of the discussion with the help of an interpreter. He was the chief executive of the company and made all the big decisions. I learned a lot about Korean business culture from that meeting. Working Across Cultures 2 Track 63 Extract 2 As soon as I got to Korea, everyone said to me, print plenty of business cards and make sure they're translated into Korean. They were right. Koreans want to know who they're dealing with and what your title is. Status is very important and a business card tells them if you're of equal status to them. When you present your card, you should hold it in both hands, and when you receive a business card, accept it with both hands and read it carefully. It shows respect. Working Across Cultures 2 Track 64 Extract 3 I was assistant to the marketing director. I had some ideas for improving the layout of our stores in Seoul, so I wrote my ideas on a sheet of paper and sent it to all of the staff in the department. Everyone commented on my ideas and approved them. I then talked to the marketing director, and he announced that there would be a project to change the layout of the stores. You see, decisions come from the top in Korean companies, but everyone needs to have their say. They call it consensus, everyone agreeing to a proposal. Working Across Cultures 2, Track 65, Extract 4 I learned one thing pretty quickly about Korean business culture. There's often a lot of red tape. You'll need a lot of official documents before you can go ahead with a project. You may spend months trying to get permissions from ministries and government officials. But a bit of networking often helps. The right contacts are so important in that culture. You need to be patient. Unit 7. New Business. Track 1. The economy is stable following the problems of the past two years, by following a tight monetary policy, the government has reduced the inflation rate to 2%. For borrowers, after going up dramatically, the interest rate is now down to 8%. The last six months have seen a slight improvement in the exchange rate against the dollar. For the country as a whole, the GDP has grown by 0.15%. Exports are increasing and the balance of trade is starting to look much healthier. In terms of jobs, the unemployment rate continues to be a problem, 
as it is still 16%. In order to stimulate the economy and attract foreign investment from abroad, the government is offering new tax incentives, as well as making a renewed effort to reduce government bureaucracy and red tape. Finally, a large skilled labour force means there could be attractive investment opportunities over the next five years. Unit 7. New Business. Track 2. Can you tell us about your business? Our company name is Dahab Shil. We are a global money transfer company. We transfer money nearly 144 countries. We help students, we help business organizations, we help international organizations like World Bank and United Nations. We help migrant workers who are in Europe or other parts of the world who want to send money back home to their family. Unit 7. New Business. Track 3. What do all successful new businesses have in common? All successful business, I believe, in my opinion, they have to have a plan, they have to have a vision of where they're going, how they're going to reach that vision. They have to motivate their staff. They have to keep their customer loyal. They have to maintain that relationship with their customer. Because at the end of the day, customer is the one who base your salary, who base your income. So you have to make sure that the customer are happy with your services. You have to maintain that relationship. So they have shield. When the customer come to us and they send money globally, we have to think about their requirements and we have to make sure they are happy. So and of course, you also have to maintain your cost. You know, if your income and your cost, uh, there is a big difference. Then, you know, you have to manage that. Of course, you prefer to get more income than your expenditure. Otherwise, if your expenditure is more than your income, your business will get, be bankrupt. You will have a problem. So you have to always Think about how to make more profit, less cost. Unit 7. New Business. Track 4. What advice would you give to anyone starting their own business? I hope they've got lots of energy. <laughs> I think it is difficult and quite hard work and needs a significant level of commitment. Uh, I think it's really, really important to make sure you understand the marketplace and who your customers are going to be uh, and how you differentiate yourself uh, or make yourself different from any of your competitors in that marketplace. People will only go to you and buy your product or your service if they feel it is added value over and above what they can get elsewhere or something they can't get elsewhere. So for me, understanding the market and the customer is absolutely critical uh, to the success of a business. The other key thing is that you've got sufficient cash. Um, things will generally not go quite to plan uh, and it's really important that you've got access to enough cash get the business going uh, to ensure you get some positive cash flow through the business. Unit 7. New Business. Track 5. I remember when I first thought about quitting my job and you advised me to gain some experience before I started a new business. I need to earn some profit as soon as possible as I don't have much spare cash. Or do I have to accept that I won't have much money while I'm starting up my new business? Do I need to have some savings while I get my new business off the ground? I'm just not sure how I'll survive until my company starts earning money. Please advise me as soon as you can. Unit 7. New Business. Track 6. 1. A. 
three hundred and sixty two B one thousand eight hundred and forty one C thirty six thousand five hundred and three D six hundred and eighty four thousand three hundred and twenty one E four million five hundred and thirty seven thousand two hundred and ninety five two A three point five B two point eight nine C nine point eight seven five Three. A. Three quarters. B. An eighth. C. Six sevenths. D. A half. E. Two thirds. Four. A. Fifteen percent. B. Fifty percent. C. Ninety-seven percent. D. A hundred percent. Five. A. Eighty pounds. B. Five thousand eight hundred dollars. C. A hundred and fifty thousand euros. D. Twenty thousand euros. Unit seven, new business, track seven, extract one. And here is the business news. This month, inflation is up by 1.2 percent. The unemployment rate is now 5 percent, giving an overall figure of 1,258,000. Unit seven, new business, track eight, extract two. Lace PLC, the supermarket giant. Reports that profits rose 12 percent to just over 1.8 billion dollars, with sales increasing a healthy 18 percent. Unit seven, new business, track nine, extract three. General Engineering said it would reduce its workforce by one third over the next five years. Resulting in the loss of five thousand jobs. Unit seven, new business, track ten, extract four. The central bank has reduced interest rates by 0.5 percent. Turning to the world economy, this will grow by 2.8 percent next year. Unit eight, marketing, track eleven. Consumer one. I read about the launch and I really wanted it, but when I tried to buy it, I just couldn't get it anywhere. My friend heard that it was in one shop and he queued up for ages, but they'd run out by lunchtime. Unit eight, marketing, track twelve, consumer two. The company held a party on a riverboat to launch their new campaign. It was absolutely fantastic. We also got a free sample and a T-shirt with the logo on as a gift at the end. Unit eight, marketing, track thirteen, consumer three. These new boots were really expensive, but definitely worth it. I think the fact that they cost so much is what really makes them different from the rival brands. Unit eight, marketing, track fourteen, consumer four. 
I've had this wallet for over 20 years and it still looks good. The leather is very high quality and very strong but still soft. The color is as good now as when it was new. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 15. Market research. Market segment. Market share. Consumer behavior. Consumer profile. Consumer goods. Product launch. Product life cycle. Product range. Sales forecast. Sales figures. Sales target. Advertising campaign. Advertising budget. Advertising agency. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 16. Which marketing methods work best when promoting your products? At the core of all um, marketing to doctors is the need to spend quality time face to face with them. Um, these are very busy people who have a, a busy day treating their patients and we often find that we only have maybe five or ten minutes within that busy day to sit down with them and take them through both the clinical, rational um, advantages of our products, why we think they should use this product compared to the ones they've been using in the past, as well as the more traditional emotional advantages of the product. Um, by emotional advantages, I might mean um, how it would help their patients, help them understand the, the benefits for their patients and how it will make them uh, have easier lives. Um, so we're still very much um, focused on how we can best present um, quite complicated data in a short period of time face to face to the doctor. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 17. What problems can you face when marketing pharmaceuticals? I think the biggest challenge for us um, is that the regulatory environment, the laws that we need to follow, and are quite strict, and quite rightly so. We in the pharmaceutical industry have the same interests as the doctor. We want to help patients lead better lives. We have to present the data in a fair and balanced way, not, not to overstate the advantages of our products. Because um, we're often trying to develop campaigns which are consistent across many different countries across Europe, and because the laws are different across these countries, it's often a challenge to work out exactly what we can say and the best way of saying it. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 18. Has the way you market your products changed much over the last few years? Unfortunately, um, because of the regulatory laws that we need to follow, uh, we're not able to promote directly to patients. We can only talk to the doctor because the doctor makes the decision about the medicine. So although we'd love to use all the benefits and opportunities that the internet and the new communication methods offer, we're not able to use them as much as we'd like to do. Having said that, we are beginning, to, I think many companies are beginning to look at the opportunities that new technologies such as the iPad may offer to present the data when we're face to face with the doctor because it's an, a, a clearer and more involving way of presenting the data to the doctor than the traditional paper. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 19. What is a typical life cycle for your products? The life cycle for a pharmaceutical product is often very long. It can take anything up to 20 years from the scientist first coming up with the idea to it finally being widely used by physicians to help patients' lives. The first 10 years of that life can be spent wholly on the clinical trials to prove that it's safe and has effect and helps the patients. 
and then the next 10 years um, spending a lot of time and effort um, presenting this data to doctors so that they, they can begin to understand which patients and in, in which situations the drug can help them. And just as we're getting to those peak sales, uh, we find that the patent on the drug will go. Um, so there's a long, a long period from the first idea to, to finally getting it out there in, in doctors' and patients' hands. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 20. 1. Yes, it's 13,456. 2. And the number is 0033-2399-0324. 3. So the email address is v.altin at sawslan.com. 4. And her address is 128-60 Ratanatibeth Road. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 21. Alpha. Bravo. Charlie. Delta. Echo. Foxtrot. Golf. Hotel. India. Juliet. Kilo. Lima. Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victor, Whiskey, X-Ray, Yankee, Zulu, Unit 8. Marketing. Track 22. Hello? Hello, Fiona. This is Martin. How are things going? Fine, thanks. I haven't received your sales report yet for the quarter. Any problems? Oh, no. Sorry, Martin. I've been really busy lately. But I can tell you we've had excellent results. Good. Yeah, we've met our sales targets and increased our market share by 2%. Our total sales were over £1.2 million. Over £1.2 million? Great! Well done. What about the new range of shampoos? Well, we had a very successful product launch. We spent 250000 on advertising it and... Sorry, did you say 215000 no, 250,000. We advertised it in the national press, took out space in trade magazines and did a number of presentations to our distributors. It was money well spent. We've had a lot of orders already and good comments from customers. I'm really pleased to hear that. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 23. Anything else to report? Yes, there is one thing. One of my biggest customers will be visiting London next week. She'd like to have a meeting with you. Fine. Could you give me a few details? What's her name? It's Mrs. Young Ju Chan. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Young Ju Chan. I'll spell that for you. Y for Yankee, O for Oscar, U for Uniform, N for November, G for Golf. Then... J for Juliet, O for Oscar, O for Oscar. Then C for Charlie, H for Hotel, A for Alpha, N for November. She's Korean, actually. She's chief buyer for BHDS. Let me give you her telephone number. 82-20735-8879. Her email address is y.juchan1 at bhds.com OK? Why not give her a ring or send her an email? She's expecting to hear from you. I'll do that. Uh, but first, let me read that back to you. It's Young Ju Chan 
from BHDS. Telephone number 8220735875. No, 8220735887. Okay, I think I've got all that. Uh, just one more thing. Did she say when she'd like to meet? Yes, she said next Thursday or Friday. That's the 17th or 18th. What about Friday the 18th? I'll give her a call and confirm by email. Right, I think that's everything. Fine. I'll get that report to you by the end of the week. Right. Bye for now. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 24. Extract 1. It's a great jacket for cold weather. I wear it to college every day during the winter. But it's not good for the summer. You get too hot in it. And it's got too many pockets. It was really cheap. I liked that. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 25. Extract 2. I'm sorry I bought it. I'm not very big, so it doesn't fit me very well. It certainly is warm and keeps me dry during the winter months, but I was really looking for something a bit more fashionable, in a bright color. You know, bright blue or yellow. My jacket's black. It's a bit dull. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 26. Extract 3. I'm quite pleased with it. It's very warm, perfect for canoeing and snowboarding. But the zipper is awful. I always take a long time to zip up. And the hood is difficult to fold up after you use it. It's quite big, so it's difficult to pack in a bag or suitcase. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 27. Extract 4. I saw an ad in a magazine, and I liked the look of it. But it took me a long time to find out where I could buy it. I'd almost given up. Then my husband spotted it in a camping store. It's very warm in winter, but I get too hot when I take the lining out and wear it in the summer. Unit 8. Marketing. Track 28. Extract 5. I spotted an advert for the jacket in our local newspaper. I filled in the order form, then waited over a month for delivery. I almost cancelled my order because of the delay. I had to phone the supplier three times before it finally arrived. I love the jacket. It's warm, practical, and keeps me dry in rainy weather. Unit 9. Planning. Track 29. Recently, we decided to open a new sales office in New York. First, I arranged a meeting with the finance department to discuss the project. We prepared a budget with details of the various costs involved. Then we collected information about possible locations for the new office. We considered two options, one in Greenwich Village and the other near Central Park. After doing some more research, I wrote a report for the Board of Directors. Unfortunately, we made a mistake when we estimated the costs, as the exchange rate changed, so we didn't keep within our budget. We overspent by almost 20%. We had to rearrange the schedule for moving into the building because the office was not redecorated in time. The Board of Directors was unhappy because we didn't meet the deadline for opening the office by December the 15th. It finally opened in January. However, we forecast sales of at least a million dollars in the first year. Unit 9. Planning. Track 30. How far ahead should businesses plan? I think that depends on the size of the business. If you're a business that has a commitment from a client for three years, you have a three-year contract, it makes sense to have a three-year plan because you can project forward those revenues, 
you know that relationship will be in place and you can make some assumptions about what you need to do as a business in order to deliver the requirements of that contract. But I think for a lot of other businesses, three years is a long time. For a lot of smaller businesses, new businesses entering the market, um, especially in technology for instance, when who knows what trends are going to come into play next month, new software, new platforms, you really can't have a three-year plan. For me personally, I like the idea of a three-month plan because it feels very manageable. I'm not guessing. And I think that is the problem with business planning. It can sometimes be business guessing. Unit 9. Planning. Track 31. What are the best business plans you know? I think the best business plans are ones that are simple and flexible enough to take into account changing markets and changing situations. Any plan that is too fixed or too set in stone becomes very unwieldy because it can't accommodate economic changes, market changes, technology changes. Unit 9. Planning. Track 32. Can you think of a business plan that failed? Yes, I think there are thousands of business plans that have failed because you're not always going to get it right. Entrepreneurs and business owners cannot predict the future. And I don't think that's a bad thing that the business plans fail. I think it's important that we as entrepreneurs learn lessons and if something's not right we can adapt it. So I think um, failure is not a bad thing. I mean I can think of a business, an entrepreneur I met recently who has set up a very successful international web-based business where entrepreneurs and startups can create business cards very cost-effectively. Now when he was planning that business he planned a previous version of it and the previous version failed and it was his lessons that he learned in that failure that led him to create version two if you like which has been enormously successful and I said to him well could you have ever anticipated or planned for what is the success now and he said well no because I was focused very much on something else I learned my lessons it didn't work and now we created something else so great he is a success because he failed, you know, that's, and that's fine. Unit 9. Planning. Track 33. We need to decide exactly when we're going to move. Any suggestions? Uh, I think July would be the best time. It's very quiet then, isn't it? You mean we don't do too much business then? Exactly. Our sales are always down that month and quite a few staff are away on holiday. We could move all the office equipment at the weekend, do everything at once. And that's the best way. Could I just say something? Go ahead. I think we should take longer to move. A weekend's too short. In my opinion, we should do it department by department. How do you mean exactly? Well, each week a different department can move. That way, there would always be people here who could handle customer inquiries, phone calls and so on. Hmm. See what you mean. Maybe it would be better to phase the move over several weeks. Of course, we'll have to keep our staff informed at every stage of the move. We can do that mainly by email. Now, moving on to the question of transport. We've contacted two companies, National Transport and Fox Removals. Sorry, could I just comment on that, Mark? Certainly. I don't think it would be a good idea to use National. Oh. I've heard one or two things about them and... I don't think they're very reliable, but Fox would be fine. They've got an excellent reputation in the trade. OK, perhaps it would be better to use Fox then. You know, there's another possibility. Hmm? We could get our own people to do the moving. What? You think our transport department could do the job? Why not? They're not too busy in July. I don't think that's a good idea. This is a really big job. We need a specialised firm for that, like Fox. Mm. They've got the experience and will do a good job, even if it does cost us a bit more. Also, Fox offers a free consultation service. Mm, you're probably right. I'll call Fox and discuss the relocation with them. 
I'll see if I can persuade them to lower their price a little. Unit 9. Planning. Track 34. You know, I think the magazine could do really well if we plan it carefully. There's a really big market for it, and I feel it's the right time to launch. The main thing will be to make it different from the other magazines out there. Yes, it's got to have some unique features, but I'm sure we'll come up with some. OK, what about target consumers? I'd say we should be aiming at men and women in the 20 to 40 age range, right? That makes sense to me. I think the magazine will also need to have clear sections. I've looked at a lot of health and fitness publications in the last few weeks. Some are an absolute mess. You've no idea where to look for the topics you're interested in. Yes, we must have well-organised content and really interesting features. Maybe a regular feature on a celebrity, a film star or top athlete talking about health and fitness. Yeah, that would be very popular, but pretty expensive. Mm, it would really increase sales. People love reading about the lives of celebrities. Another thing, you know, once we get some readers, we need to keep their loyalty. So they go on buying the magazine. We must find ways of doing that. Of course. The website can help us to stay closely in touch with readers and keep them buying the magazine. Do you think the online content should be free of charge? Um, I suppose we could offer some free content, then make readers pay a subscription for premium content. Extra materials like DVD workout programs, that sort of thing. OK, let's see what the teams think about that. They'll have plenty of good ideas for the magazine and website. Working Across Cultures 3, Track 35, Call 1. It's the first time we have heard about this, and my view is that we should find out more about what the markets think. Because no, I think this and is then because it of will, the way that... And then I'm sure that... I the, think that... Working Across Cultures 3, Track 36, Call 2. It's the right time to think about the new marketing strategy for all the new ranges across all the markets, except for the Latin American region, where I think we should adopt a different approach. Working Across Cultures 3, Track 37, Call 3. Well, I, I don't think it will work here, but I like the idea in general. Sorry, I don't know who said that. Where are you? Yes, sorry, this is Carlos in Australia. Working Across Cultures 3, Track 38, Call 4. Yes, about the marketing strategy. Well, this reminds me of the time when I was playing golf with Mr. Takagi, and he told me about the best way to hit the ball. There's an old Japanese proverb, which is a very good way of remembering the importance... Working Across Cultures 3, Track 39. Call 5. Yes. Hello? Is there anybody there? I'm a bit late, sorry. Uh, how, how does this microphone work again? Let's see. Uh, if I do this, then maybe... Working Across Cultures 3. Track 40. Call 6. Martin, what do you think? Well, my suggestion is to look at the finance again to try and save uh, as much as we can on the ad for the... Working Across Cultures 3, Track 41. Hello, everyone. <laughs> right, in this afternoon's session of the cultural training course, and before you go to your breakout groups, I'd like to talk a bit about international conference calls. These are becoming more and more common and cheaper now that the web is being used for phone calls. 
Firstly, I'd like to look at the most common problems and then move on to a few tips and pieces of advice. I suppose many things are common sense. However, it can all take some getting used to. The first thing to say is about technology. This is probably the most common problem I hear about. There are a lot of different systems and, as with all technology, it sometimes goes wrong. Systems can crash and people get cut off. So be prepared for that, as it can be very frustrating. Also, there are times when there are people taking part in a conference call who are not familiar with the technology and who don't know how the equipment works. This is a training issue. The other thing is, background noise can be a big problem, especially if a mobile or cell phone is used, as these tend to pick up a lot of background noise. Finally, there may be problems with people not being sensitive and speaking very fast, maybe because of nerves or just because they behave differently on the phone. Working Across Cultures 3, Track 42. And now I'd like to look at a few solutions to the problems and offer some tips for both participants and call leaders. It may seem obvious, but when you are part of a conference call, make sure you are in a quiet place and not likely to be interrupted or disturbed. This follows on from what I said earlier. Actually, the mute button is important to use when you are not speaking so that you can reduce background noise. Personally, I use a headset for this type of call. Also, try and avoid eating, drinking, or chewing gum while on a conference call, as this can be noisy for others. If you really need to have a drink, remember to use the mute button. Moving on to participants, a few quick pieces of advice. Prepare for the call in advance. Think about and plan what you may need to say and perhaps any questions you may have. Have any documents you may need close to hand so that you don't need to look for them during the call. Being on time is also important. When speaking, if it's not clear from the technology being used, it can be helpful to say who you are each time you speak. For example, This is Mike. I didn't catch the name of the marketing firm. Could you say it again, please? As in face-to-face -face meetings, when you speak, stay on topic. Short contributions will be more memorable, and a conference call is not really the place for long speeches. Another good tip is to signal or label what you say. For example, this is Mike, and my idea is... The other thing to say is, Try not to interrupt people when they are speaking. Listen carefully and wait to be invited to comment by the call leader. Avoid taking notes on a computer as typing will be noisy for the other participants. A pen and paper, although old-fashioned, is still effective. <laughs> <laughs> Unit 10. Managing People. Track 43. Which management styles have influenced or impressed you? I have been impressed by many different managers, but I would like to mention three managers with a broadly similar style. I believe these three managers are pioneers in the effective management of people. Firstly, Lord Seif, S-I-E-F-F, -F, who for many years was chairman of Marks and Spencer, Britain's foremost retail store. Lord Seif placed emphasis on quality control, profit and staff welfare. An enduring feature of Lord Seif's belief was that the effective management of the business organisation, particularly in the retail sector, and good human relations at work are two aspects of the same thing. Unit 10. Managing People. Track 44. The two other managers I have selected both share a similar philosophy and managerial style. 
Second, Dame Anita Roddick, from 1976, founder of The Body Shop, which specializes in beauty and cosmetic features. Anita Roddick displayed a genuine, caring attitude towards staff, but is perhaps best known in Britain because she had a strong belief in environmental and social issues, feminist principles, and practical aid to third world countries. A very interesting aspect of Anita Roddick's management style was she firmly believed that it's not possible to provide environmental and social support without making profit. Secondly, she was quite honest in saying that she was in business to make profit, including some profits for herself, as well as the substantial sum she gave to third world countries. Third is Sir Richard Branson, famed her since 1970 of the Virgin brand of over 360 companies. Sir Richard Branson is well known for combining a true entrepreneurial spirit with a genuine concern for people. Unit 10, Managing People, Track 45. What do those three managers have in common? All three managers have or had a genuine belief in effective communication, involvement and availability for their staff. Visibility, so that staff can see them, approach them, and they were able to have the immediate contact with them. Or either did or do engender a genuine commitment from members of their staff. All three had or have a genuine belief in creating a climate of mutual consideration, respect and trust with their staff. Unit 10. Managing People. Track 46. OK, Anna, would you like to begin? Well, the level of absenteeism has gone up over the month. We need to monitor sickness levels more closely. Mm. What do you think, Kurt? Motivation is the biggest issue. Staff feel that no one listens to them. I see the union representative is here. Would you like to add anything? The unions want more days holiday per year. This will lead to lower sickness levels. How about you, Barbara? Hmm. Well, our staff have more days holiday than any of our competitors. There is no excuse for the present level of absenteeism. Unit 10. Managing People. Track 47. What would you like to do this evening, Paul? I don't know. I haven't planned anything. Well, why don't you join me for dinner? I'm meeting a friend of mine tonight, Abdullah. He's got many business interests here. He could help you a lot while you're here. He's got a lot of contacts with carpet manufacturers. Mm, it's very kind of you to invite me, Mohammed, but I think I'd prefer to stay in the hotel if you don't mind. I'm really tired at the moment. It was a long flight and I feel a little jet lagged. I need an early night. OK, Paul, I quite understand. Perhaps we could meet Abdullah at the weekend. I'd be delighted to. I want to make as many business contacts as possible while I'm here. Unit 10. Managing People. Track 48. I don't know too much about Syria, Abdullah. What do people like doing here in their spare time? Well, we like the same things as Western people. We like to meet our friends in cafes and chat about business, sports, that sort of thing. And we like watching football in the evening on television. Women enjoy talking to their friends and, of course, going shopping. Everyone likes that. What about you, Paul? What do you usually do after work? How do you spend your evenings? I generally watch TV with my wife. We often eat out at a restaurant. We enjoy that. And at the weekend, we play squash or tennis at a local club. How about you, Mohammed? 
What's your favorite pastime? I like to go out to restaurants and meet my friends in coffee houses. We often go to a hammam. I love that. It's so relaxing after you've been working all day. Would you like to visit one? Mm, it sounds very interesting, but I don't think I have enough time. Thanks for the offer, though. Maybe on my next visit we could do that. Unit 10. Managing people. Track 49. So, what was your main purpose in coming to Damascus? I'm looking for a company to supply carpets for my store. The carpets you make here are excellent quality, and they're very popular in the UK. So far, I haven't had much luck. Can you recommend anyone, Abdullah? I could make some inquiries for you if you like. Oh, that's very kind of you. Actually, I do know someone who might help you. It's a family business in the north of the city, run by Sharif Hamad. He specializes in traditional designs. I believe his prices are very reasonable. Hold on a minute. I've got his business card. Here you are. Thanks very much. I'll give him a call tomorrow. Can I mention your name? Please do. I've known him for years. Would you like me to give him a call first to introduce you? Thanks. That would be very helpful. I'd really appreciate it. Now, let me recommend something else. Tomorrow evening, you must visit our famous mosque. It was built a long time ago and everyone visits it when they're in Damascus. I'll take you there by car. You're very kind. Thanks very much. I'd love to see it. Uh, goodbye. All the best. Unit 10. Managing people. Track 50. Let me give you a bit of information about the two newest members of the team. OK. I'll make a few notes. Well, Adriana is the youngest member. Mm -hmm. She's been with us just over a year. She's an economics graduate with a good head for figures. So far, she's doing pretty well. She met her sales target last year. She's come up with some good ideas for improving our website and she's added several clients to our database. Ah. She seems to know how to get new business for the company, so she's definitely got potential. Good. But she does have weaknesses. Oh. She lacks social skills. She doesn't get on very well with the other members of the team. Ah. And she's not comfortable when meeting clients for the first time. She never seems to be at ease with them. One other thing, her presentations to clients are not yet up to the standard we normally expect. Mm. It sounds as if she's still got a lot to learn. Yes. Also, she doesn't like our payment system at all. She thinks it's very unfair. OK. What about Ahmed? Well, he's been with us just over two years. We hired him to improve our contacts with Arab clients. He's made a good start. His sales record's fine, and at the moment, he's searching for properties for several wealthy clients. Excellent. Yes, but there are some problems with him. Uh -huh. He doesn't spend much time in the office. He's always out socialising with clients, so we mm. don't see much of him. Well, not as much as we'd like. He doesn't come to many meetings, and he's made no contribution, really, to building up our database. Mm. He's not really a team player at all. Very independent. Some consultants say he's actually uncooperative. Mm, that's not good for team spirit. How does he feel about the payment system? He's very happy with it. He can't understand why some of the consultants complain about it. Unit 11. Conflict. Track 51. 1. Patience. Patient. 2. Calmness. Calm. Three. Weakness. Weak. Four. Flexibility. Flexible. Five. Emotion. Emotional. Six. Consistency. Consistent. Seven. Sympathy. Sympathetic. Eight. 
Formality. Formal. Nine. Enthusiasm. Enthusiastic. Ten. Creativity. Creative. Unit eleven. Conflict. Track fifty two. Can you tell us about your organisation? Our organisation, the Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution, was founded um, 20 years ago. Um, its base is in London and um, its main outputs are to um, teach business and make business more aware of more effective ways of dealing with conflict. And our two um, primary areas of business are first skills, so we've been involved in training up to 40,000 mediators around the world um, and we're also involved in providing services so we have mediators who mediate um, around the UK and around the world in business complex. Unit 11 Conflict Track 53 What are the commonest causes of conflict at work? We actually surveyed this last year and the findings are interesting. The key problem is inappropriate communication or no communication. So I would say avoidance so that managers are not uh, dealing with their employees as effectively as they might. There's a lot of European legislation now around the areas of sex discrimination and unfair work practices and this does lead to a lot of controversy in the workplace. I think other areas um, are clash of personalities, culture, different belief systems and interestingly um, I think a lot of employees feel that uh, their workloads can be very oppressive. Unit 11. Conflict. Track 54. How do you help to resolve business disputes? It's about trying to have um, an early dialogue and to recognise there is a problem. And then it's about having a good process. And that involves getting key decision makers to um, allow enough time so typically um, we would say they need to allow at least half a day but in a bigger business problem at least a day and it's having a good agenda and it's making sure that the difficult issues are talked about in the right kind of format with a mediator both privately and in a group as well and then private debriefs of the different protagonists in the conflict and then bringing together parts of those groups to actually improve the levels of communication and to work on really constructive problem solving and a real focus on finding the solution. Unit 11 Conflict Track 55 if I reduced the price by 7%, would you give me a firm order? Hmm, I don't know. Only 7%? I was hoping for a little more. If we increased our order, would you give us a bigger discount? OK, uh, how about this? If you increase your order to 1,000 units, we'll give you a 10% discount. That's fair, isn't it? A thousand units, hmm. Okay, a thousand units, 10% discount. Agreed. Good. What about spare parts? Can you supply them pretty quickly? We can probably get them to you within a week. Uh, how about that? That's fine. I think we've covered most things, except terms of payment. If you give us 90 days credit, we'll sign the order today. 
Ninety days. Hmm.、Uh, we might find that a little difficult. Unit Eleven, Conflict, Track Fifty Six. Okay, Rachel. So you want to talk about your salary? I see you're currently earning about sixty thousand dollars. Yes, that's why I'm here. I think I'm worth a lot more than that to the company. My work's greatly undervalued at the moment, so I'm here to ask for a raise. Right. What figure do you have in mind? A hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I know it's double my present salary, but I'm worth it. I've done really well in the last two years. I've exceeded my targets by almost forty percent, and none of the sales staff has done better than that. True, but a one hundred percent increase—it's not going to happen. Look, I know for a fact that Sophie Legrand got a raise recently, and her salary's over a hundred thousand dollars. She's doing the same work as me, and not getting such good results. It's not fair, is it? I should be getting the same salary as her. Look, Rachel, I'm not going to discuss the salaries of the other staff with you. Put yourself in our shoes. We're facing a difficult economic situation. You know that. We've all got to cut costs. There's no way the directors would approve such a huge increase in salary for you. Well, not at the moment, anyway. I understand what you're saying, but the fact is. I'm being underpaid for the results I'm getting. I'm not happy about it, not happy at all. Other sales staff are being treated much better than me. You know there are other companies I could work for. Don't forget that. I'm not sure I like the tone of what you're saying, Rachel. Threats won't get you anywhere. I'm just trying to tell you how I feel. That's all. Okay, I understand what you're saying. I can see your point of view. Look, we do value your work. I can assure you, but times are very difficult at the moment. There's no way the directors would agree to pay you over a hundred thousand dollars right away. Let me suggest a compromise. How about if we give you an increase to say eighty thousand dollars now, and promise to review your salary in six months' time? Eighty thousand dollars immediately, and then a review. Hmm. I was hoping for a bit more. Okay, if you guarantee I'll get a review later on, I guess I'd be happy with that. I promise you will do that. I'm chairman of the review committee, and I'll make sure your salary is discussed. Okay. I suppose that's acceptable. Right. I'm pleased to hear it. I think we've covered everything. I'll be writing to you to confirm the increase. Unit Eleven, Conflict, Track Fifty Seven. Good morning, Joan. What can you tell us about Herman and Corey Tees? Well, they're well established, a very well-run company. They usually make a profit, but some analysts think they could be doing a lot better. Uh huh. What about their values? Their principles. Okay, they're what we'd call a green company, very green. For example, they won't buy tea from suppliers if chemicals have been used to grow the tea, and of course, they're against the use of any pesticides in the growing process. Right. Another thing, they were one of the first tea companies to get a certificate as a fair trade producer. Hmm, impressive.、Mm, yeah, they have very high standards indeed. They always invest part of their profits in the areas and communities which supply their tea, and they promote production methods that benefit local agriculture and the tea producers. You know, they even try to recycle the boxes used for packaging. So you see, they really care about the environment. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. One other thing you could mention, Joan: the company's got very loyal staff, I believe. People say it's their biggest asset. They have a policy of keeping workers, even when economic conditions are really bad.、Mm -hmm. They'd rather lose money than lay off workers. Yes, they really look after their workers. That's true. 
Do you think the management will recommend accepting UCC's offer? I don't know, to be honest, but they'll be holding a meeting soon, and I suppose they'll make up their minds then. I understand the company's staff are strongly against the offer, so the meeting will be pretty lively. Okay. Well, when we know, we'll invite you back to comment on the decision, Joan. <laughs> Unit twelve, products, track fifty-eight, speaker one. I'm 20 years old, and I've wanted a Ford Mustang since I was 10. I now have an eye-catching 1998 black Mustang Coupe with leather seats. This car is fast and furious and is everything I have always dreamed of. It has been virtually maintenance-free. I give my friends a ride in it with the top down, and they think it's awesome. Overall, it's comfortable, reliable, gives great performance, has great interior and exterior design, and is fun to drive. Unit 12. Products. Track 59. Speaker 2. The best thing I've ever bought is a trampoline for my son and daughter. They've had hours and hours of fun playing on it with their friends, and it's been really good for parties. It's weatherproof and durable. It really has lasted a long time, over 12 years. I've even used it myself. It's a great form of exercise. It wasn't cheap, but we were happy to pay for safety and wanted a high-quality trampoline. Ours has a strong, rigid frame and high-quality springs, so we get a really deep bounce. If you want to buy one, make sure it fits the space in your garden. And for safety, remember that all trampolines are designed for one jumper at a time. Unit 12. Products. Track 60. Speaker 3. Well, I work from home and used to spend a lot of time propping myself up in bed with a laptop. But I recently bought this fantastic chair that copies the shape of your body when it's stretched out. It's made from an aluminum and plastic frame and has lots of pillows that support every part of the body. The computer monitor is cleverly suspended in front of me to prevent neck strain. The keyboard and mouse are designed to be placed on the user's lap. I really can relax whilst using the internet and I haven't had any neck problems since I started using it. Also, the curved frame provides support for my back. It's also eye-catching and quite popular with my design-conscious friends. Unit 12. Products. Track 61. Speaker 4. I'm an experienced backpacker and I've been to four continents, up mountains, through deserts and jungles, and slept in smart hotels and on train station benches. Obviously, everyone needs a good rucksack when travelling. But to answer your question, a large Arab scarf. That was the best thing I ever bought. It's a sarong, a scarf, a turban, a beach towel, a bath towel. Tie the corners together and you've got a bag. Hang it from a window for 15 minutes and it's dry. All backpackers should get one. Unit 12. Products. Track 62. What makes a product great? The three or four things I would look for in a product, what makes a great product, is that it's, firstly, that it's easy to use. That you don't need to think about what you need to do. You don't have to spend time reading a manual. That it's intuitive and simple and obvious of how you should use that. The other thing is, at its heart, a uh, product should solve a problem or fulfill a need. So, for example, the, um, the electric cars that are coming out today, they solve an essential problem in the world, which is that we are running out of oil and at the same time there is a problem with global warming caused by burning fossil fuels. So that's a great example, electric car, of something that solves a problem. 
And the third point is simply that it should be functional, that it should be helpful, that it should make your life easier and make things better in some way. Unit 12. Products. Track 63. It's the Tesla Roadster. It's the new electric vehicle which goes from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 3.4 seconds. I drove one in France in from, from Nice to Cannes about a month ago and I've never driven a car as exciting as this. Driving it is like a cross between driving a Scalextric car, a bumper car that you used to have at the old fun fairs and probably still do have at fun fairs, and a rocket ship. The response that you have from the accelerator is instant. So it's not like with a turbo lag, it's not driving a, a petrol driven car where there's some gap between when you push the pedal and it goes. It's absolutely instant. And as you release your foot from the accelerator, the car slows down in the same way a Scalextric car does when you pull on the trigger. So the Tesla is very exciting. Unit 12, Products, Track 64. What product do you expect to see in the near future? There's a number of innovations that I think are happening at the moment that will give us new and exciting products. Possibly one of the most exciting is the driverless car. Not because I don't like driving, but sometimes driving can be very boring. Driving in cities is a pain as opposed to driving in the countryside. Driverless cars will be with us certainly by 2020. General Motors plan to have a driverless car on the road by 2018. Google has put money into this. Audi is putting money into this. We're in a position at the moment where cars are shifting from completely driver controlled to some control by the car itself, by the computer within the car. And what we'll see over the next years is the shift so that just as with a 747 um, aeroplane, you can either drive it yourself or hand it over to the machine to drive. Unit 12, Products, Track 65. What's your favourite product and why? My favourite product is my Mac computer. It's a black Mac, so it looks good. And the reason I like it is because I'm a journalist. It's the thing that I use to write my work on. Uh, I'm writing a novel. It's the thing I use to write my novel on. It connects me to email because obviously I have Wi-Fi at home. When I go to a cafe, I have Wi-Fi. I take it with me when I go on holiday and I go to places that have Wi-Fi. I can Skype video and talk to friends in New York. I can Skype video and talk to friends in Australia. I'm in constant contact with my parents through the machine and it has the wealth of the internet, the information that is there and all the people that that can connect me to. So for me, my computer and its connection to the internet and its connection to people around the world makes it invaluable and makes my life more connected and more fun. Unit 12, Products, Track 66. I'm going to tell you about our new product, a fast ice cube maker for use in the kitchen. It was designed by Paolo Rossi and launched last month. We're promoting it at the moment on the TV shopping channels and using a lot of point-of-sale advertising. We're distributing it to upmarket department stores and specialist kitchenware shops. Now, about the product. It comes in three colours, white, black and silver. It has several special features. As you can see, it's stylish, well-designed and elegant, as you would expect from a Paolo Rossi product. We think it will be extremely popular with people who like giving parties. It's made of stainless steel and is very sturdy. It's a bit larger and heavier than some other ice-making machines. 
It weighs approximately 12 kilos, but it's very strong and reliable. It was tested for months before we put it on the market, and it never broke down. You can check its dimensions in the handout I'll be giving you. What about its main selling points? Well, it's very economical in terms of power and exceptionally quiet when you're using it to make ice. Also, it's easy to use. You just put water in and press a button. Nothing could be simpler. What about its performance? Well, that's one of the ice maker's outstanding features. It produces faster and bigger quantities of ice than any other model. It can produce 15 ice cubes in eight minutes, two kilos of ice in an hour, or 18 kilos in 24 hours. Incredible! Now a word or two about its benefits for the user. Firstly, it'll save party givers a lot of time making ice cubes. And because the machine's so versatile, it can make cubes of different sizes. It's fairly expensive compared with other models. The retail price is around 320 euros. But it's great value for money because it comes with a full five-year guarantee on parts and labour. We think the ice maker is a real winner. From now on, when people give parties, there won't be any embarrassing moments when they run out of ice and have to wait hours for a few more cubes. Those days are over. It simply won't happen if they have our ice maker in their kitchen. Thanks very much, everyone. Are there any questions? Unit 12. Products. Track 67. OK, Hugh, I think we're ready now to put everything in writing on the website. Shall I summarise what we've agreed? Sure, go ahead. OK, first point. We're looking for products that show originality and creativity. If they're really unique, so much the better. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Our awards are meant to encourage innovation. It's the most important point, so it's got to come first in the list of criteria. OK. Next, I think this point is important too, we're looking for things that improve consumers' lifestyle, that give them a better quality of life or a wider choice of a product, maybe. Yes, we want products that really benefit consumers in some way. OK. And I think we also agreed the winning products will need to be um, environmentally friendly. Is that right? Well, all we actually said was that they shouldn't be bad for the environment, not harmful to it in some way. Right. We had three other points for the list. Mm -hmm. um, the winning companies will have to explain to us their plans for marketing their products, mm -hmm. tell us how they'll advertise and promote them, and they get bonus points if they have creative plans, if their marketing is a bit different in some way. Uh-huh. Now, let's see, what else? We want the products to make plenty of money for the company. Mm. They've got to be profitable. So the question we'll be asking them is, will it make money or is it just a fad? Here today, gone tomorrow. Exactly. And the last point, is the product advanced in terms of technology? Uh, I, I think we can put that another way, Chica. The question is, has the company used technology in a new way, in an interesting or exciting way? Mm. That's what we're looking for. Working Across Cultures 4, Track 68. Today we're going to be talking about culture, what it is and how knowledge of it can help when doing business internationally. I've divided my talk into two parts. Firstly, I'd like to talk about the visible aspects of culture, the things we can see. And secondly, the invisible aspects, the parts we can't see. OK, so firstly, the visible aspects. Earlier I asked you to think about this. What did you come up with? The weather. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you laugh, but it does have an effect on culture and behaviour. Anything else? We came up with food, written language, the way people drive, mm. and uh, the style of buildings. Yes, very good. The point is that these are easy to see and may be different to what you are used to. 
In business terms, this will also include the way people greet each other and how close they stand when talking, what we call personal space. This may also extend to the use of gestures with the hands or face, in other words, body language. There may also be differences between the roles of men and women. Working Across Cultures 4, Track 69. Moving on, I'd now like to take a quick look at the other aspects of culture which we cannot see, the invisible parts. These are things such as beliefs and attitudes, which are important because they help us to understand how people in other cultures think and operate. This will depend on the whole structure of society, how important things like the individual, the family, the team or group is. Building relationships and developing trust over a period of time are much more important in certain cultures than getting instant results. Risk-taking may be seen in a different way, so it may take longer to make decisions. Attitudes to time are also important, not only in relation to things like deadlines, but how long or short-term the thinking is. Business deals could take a very long time. One further point is about the status of a person. Remember, status may be linked to age or connections, rather than simply talent or ability. Overall, it's clear to me that when people talk about cultural problems, they are usually in these areas. They're not language problems. They're to do with misunderstandings of behaviour caused by attitudes and values which are different and may be difficult to understand. To sum up, the most important thing when doing business with other cultures is to be more aware of your own culture. What is normal for you may seem strange to people from other cultures. As well as thinking about your own culture, the final tips I can give are to be sensitive, to try and notice things and be flexible in your approach. You can't hope to cover everything, but with a little bit of research, an open mind and an awareness of your own culture, you can go far. Thank you, and good luck. Copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2012.